across Victoria until 6. You're with Nicole Tavastic on ABC Victoria. Well, seeing uh, crayfish crawl out of the river that gives them life or cod or golden perch lying there asphyxiating is part of the horror of Victoria's flood emergency today. Peter Phillips remembers paddling 2,000 kilometres over 50 days along the Murray River during the 2016 floods, the Guardian reports. Most of that was black water, which had had all of its oxygen sucked out by decaying organic material that had been washed into the system. That's what did it then. But Peter Phillips says this time round, the black water is different and smells like sewage. He is a biologist and an environmental science teacher. Peter Phillips, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Nicole. What are we seeing this time round, Peter Phillips, that um, is so concerning? Well, it's it, concerning, yeah, concerning and, and different. Um, it's the water has been clear. It's changing all the time. It has been sort of relatively clear, turbid, brown, like your last caller um, described it, um, but not black and not full of organic matter. Um, so concerning also because um, it, the smell of sewage, the feel of sewage in the water and the, the death of the fish um, means that it's um, got to do with people, not to do with the environment uh, as such. What so is, it's, what it's is, really you know, not very healthy. What is the extent of the fish kill? I haven't got exact numbers. The fisheries would be better um, placed to answer that. But um, in terms of um, distribution, um, I know of it from um, New Merca in the east um, up to Deniliquin and beyond. Uh, and um, here where I live in Echuca, um, and we're hearing of it um, down Swan Hill and uh, further down the river as well. So it's it's over a large area. What are you hundreds of kilometres? Sure. So I'm not asking um, what the official statistics are. I'm just asking what you're seeing, Peter Phillips. This Guardian article says the fish are suffering. Many have died. There are sightings of crayfish crawling out of the river. That's right. Yes. Um, I haven't seen the crayfish. It's actually hard to, it, at the moment, it's, we're a bit like in COVID lockdown, actually. Um, we can't get on the river, so we're reliant on what um, people report. And there are reports everywhere of um, crays needing to be rescued. Uh, and there's a group called Ozfish who are actually going around. They're licensed by um, fisheries to collect and uh, rescue these crays and to take them to, um, to places where they can be kept um, where they can survive. Uh, that's right, and then re, re, um, restocked back in the river. Some of these places, some of them are like fish farms and others are um, parts of the river which haven't been affected. So the Goulburn upstream of Shepparton, um, the Campaspe anywhere upstream of Echuca, um, or the um, Murray um, upstream of the Barmer Forest. But, Peter, that, you know... To an outsider, that sounds like just a hellscape, uh, crayfish crawling out of the river to join the kangaroos. It is. It's actually, there's some, floods can regenerate, and they do rejuvenate and regenerate the landscape. But uh, on top of all the flooding uh, we've experienced as a community and the devastation, um, seeing the fish die which is, uh, and the crays, which was both such prized, um, they're, they're iconic in, in our community. Um, people tell stories of the big yellow bellies, the big cod or the crays they caught, and to see them just gathering by the side of the river and, and suffering and dying is, is, is devastating. It, it hits um, all parts of the community, old and young, yep. Peter Phillips, where do you think this sewerage has come from? Well, the most upstream source is uh, that I can detect using the um, dissolved oxygen graphs is uh, Shepparton Marupna. It's not coming, the, yeah, it, it could become, it, it's also coming from other places and EPA refer to that. They say anywhere that's got a septic tank, which is flooded, any part of town 
which is um, which is flooded, and we've got quite a bit flooded in our community on the with our infamous levee bank that divides the town. Um, but also any farm, so it can come from many places. But the Shepherd and Marupna case is is um, is different, and it's it's got to do with the way the river is flooded. It's quite complex. You know, we've got the Campaspe and the Goulburn and the Murray all coming together in a very short space at Ichuka, and that's influenced the way it's flooded. And um, it's a it's about a one in a hundred year event up here. Um, the last time uh, that people, I think the last time the Murray flowed backwards at Barmer, so this is about 30 kilometres upstream of the, where the Goulburn enters, um, I think was 1956 and before that was probably 1870. So this is, this is a, a really sort of rare event, the combination of flows, the big flow we had coming down the Campaspe, huge. Um, it's difficult to estimate the size the, the, um, because a lot of the flood meters actually got washed out by the flood. Um, but the, the, um, it has been estimated at about 82,000 megalitres a day, which is uh, the Campaspe is a relatively small river compared to the Murray. Um, and yet that is the size of a Murray flood. Why do you, uh, th was... why do you think that it's come from Marupna? Shepparton because there you know it could have flushed from agricultural sites there are multiple on-site septic tanks and seepage trenches right across the district why are you convinced it's come from the Shep Marupna area? Well um, there's a dissolved oxygen meter which wasn't knocked out at a place called McCoy's Bridge which is where the Murray Valley Highway crosses the Goulburn before it enters the Murray and levels started to decrease there. There were also reports of sewage spills in, in Shepparton and Marupna, and up here, the air just stunk of sewage um, across the whole of you know, northern Victoria, which was flooded. But um, it, it has to do with the, the – it didn't – it could – come from three places here in Ichuka. If I just start from Ichuka, it could have come down the Campaspe, it could have come down the Goulburn, or it could have come down the Murray. It wasn't witnessed in the Campaspe, neither the smells nor the fish deaths, so it didn't come down the Campaspe, not, not in levels which were causing trouble. It didn't come down the Murray uh, and through the Barma Forest because the, um, the dissolved oxygen meters in the forest um, showed it's still at healthy levels, which is above, say, four parts per million. At its lowest, it dropped for about 3.5, 5, and fish start dying at about two. Um, it seems to, when you piece all the graphs together, all the data together, it seems to have come from Shepparton, been dammed up at the, dammed up by flows, the high flow from the Campaspe, at a place called um, Old Canyapala, which is a, it's an ancient lake in the landscape, about 18 kilometres across. And normally it's just farms, but right now it's a lake. So what do you think is the source? So it's, the source is, uh, the source seems to be in the Goulburn, seems to be um, the flooded homes in Shepparton and Marupna. There were thousands of homes went under. I thought it would be, I thought it would have been the sewage works but um, the operator says they weren't flooded. They did discharge what they call Class C water, but it's fully treated. So um, I think it was um, those flooded homes. You see, every t when a home goes under, uh, its pipes, its sewage pipes are exposed to the water, and basically whatever's in, in the pipes in that area ends up in the river. And with the river dammed up behind the huge Campaspe flood, it was still and gradually growed. And you can actually see that in, in the graphs. It, it's taking the oxygen out of the water progressively over about seven days. And that water then actually goes north over the landscape because it can't get through, backed up against the big Campaspe flood, and actually goes over land through flood channels and, and uh, links into other creeks and actually goes in it. Barmer, 
into the Barma Forest to the on the west of it, up the Golpa Creek, all the way to Daniloquin. Peter, you're um, you're a biologist. You're currently doing a PhD on the interaction between hydrology, geomorphology, and ecology during flood events. What needs yes. what needs to be done right now urgently to deal with this? There's not much you can do on a big scale. It's, except it's, cr- except save crays that are crawling out of the river trying to look for refuge. That's right. We've actually got um, paddle steamer own- owners um, nosing their boats into shore and, and turn- letting their motors run all day so the paddle wheels actually oxygenate the water. Oh. Um, we've got cash from management people uh, trying to um, maintain um, sort of billabongs, keep them isolated and use irrigation water to keep those levels healthy and um, have that as a refuge for fish. Um, irrigation water can be used and, and may be being used in other places to to provide refuges for the fish too. But in terms, they sort of nose their way into it. They find the good water. Um, but in terms of um, what you can do for the river, um, it is cleaning itself. It will pass. Now, the problem is um, when the river has no oxygen, it's a bit like uh, even if it lasts, say, one, two, three, four, five days, for a day we don't go too well either. I'm sorry, I just lost that last sentence. Peter, what did you say? So Sorry, if we can't breathe for a day, it's it's not good. We don't last. Um, so, you know, even if it doesn't last long, even if the river does improve, uh, once the fish are dead, they're dead. So it's... it's um, It is heartbreaking. It is indeed. Thank you for speaking to us this afternoon, Peter. I I just uh, wish that there was more than we can do than save random craze and uh, bless the paddle steamers for oxygenating the water where where they are. I guess we could always stop making climate change worse than it already is. That's about, yeah, we can sort of start looking at the, the causes, but there's no really easy solution. One of, one of the big things is um, try not to build on floodplains. And if we do allow building on floodplains, then um, uh, put up proper levees which protect the houses, you know, actually invest in the infrastructure, which is going to both protect people and the environment. Oh, try not to kill because the environment. That's, that's, always, that was, that's always a good starting point to... Uh, yes. Peter, uh, amazing to talk to you. Thank you for your time. Uh, you're welcome, Nicole. Peter Phillips, flood ecologist and a Chuka High School environmental teacher. He is a biologist and he is also doing a PhD in this very topic. Before he was a high school teacher, He was a biologist and he is currently doing his PhD on the interaction between hydrology, geomorphology and ecology during flood events. He's on the front line. 1300 303 468 if you'd like to join the conversation. Let's get the latest news headlines. Lexi Junowick is...